Welcome back, Highlanders, to part two of chapter one. Uh, remember, we left off the last video talking about perverse incentives and secondary effects and how that could cause the outcome of your policy to be the exact opposite of what you uh, uh, intended to do with that policy. And we're going to pick it up with this video, starting off with the difference between positive versus normative economic statements. This is something that you might have learned if you took Econ 3, which remember is a prerequisite for this course. But even if you didn't take pre, uh, Econ 3 or even if you uh, uh, took it but don't remember it, don't worry. We're going to go through it to make sure everybody's on the same page. So a positive economic statement is the study of what is or is not. And the idea behind positive economics is that it is testable. So you can actually test these ideas or theories, right? Again, a positive statement could be true or not true, but the idea is that you can test it to see if it's true or not true. So a positive statement might be, uh, for example, in 2017, the United States emitted 5,140 million metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Now, again, we can test that to see if that's true, that's the ex uh, to see if that's the exact amount that we emitted into the atmosphere. Again, it could be true or not true, but the idea is that we can test it to see if it's true or not true. And that's different than a normative economic statement. A normative economic statement is the study of what people think should be, and therefore is based on people's uh, subjective opinion or value judgment, and it's not really testable. So a normative statement might be, for example, the United States should drastically reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that they're emitting every year. Well, should they? Again, some people might think they should. Some people maybe think they shouldn't. You can't really test whether or not they should do that. Right? So again, positive statements are testable. Normative economic statements are not. And I want, you to make sure, I want to make sure that you know the difference between this because a lot of people make statements as if they're positive statements, as if they're a fact, when in reality they're just based off of that person's opinion. Right? So uh, if you're looking for another example, a positive statement might be something like uh, it's 82 degrees outside. We can test to see whether or not it's 82 degrees, right? So that's a testable statement. That's what makes it a positive statement. A normative statement might be something along the lines like it's too hot outside. Well, it being too hot outside is a matter of opinion or, again, somebody's personal preferences. It's not really something you can test. So you can test whether or not it's 82 degrees. You can't test whether or not it is too hot outside. So saying it's too hot outside is a normative statement. Right. So again, make sure you know there will be positive and normative economic statements. With that in mind, the next thing we're going to talk about is the difference between the economic versus the moral approach to studying the environment. So the economic approach explores environmental issues from the standpoint of competing preferences using ideas like cost-benefit analysis in an effort to reach a social optimum. So the economic approach understands that there is a difference of preferences among individuals, and nobody's preferences are inherently morally superior or better. So some people might prefer a cleaner environment at the expense of economic activity. Other people might prefer more economic activity at the expense of a cleaner environment. Neither preference is, again, uh, inherently right or wrong. So that's the economic approach. Now, that's the approach we're going to be using most in this class because this is an economics class. However, there is what we call the moral approach to the environment, which is the idea that environmental degradation is a result of unethical and immoral human behavior. And the moral approach elevates the preferences for the environment as being morally superior to preferences for, say, economic activity at the expense of the environment. So an example of the moral approach is uh, 2019 times person of the year. Greta Thunberg came uh, in front of the United Nations and she gave that uh, impassioned speech saying, how dare you? How dare you take away my childhood dreams and my futures with talks of endless economic activity, saying that uh, the United Nations was wrong for not taking a bigger stance in helping or protecting the environment at the expense of that economic activity, saying that what they were doing was morally uh, wrong. Right. Whereas if they uh, did more to protect the environment, then they'd be more morally or ethically correct. Um, probably the greatest example of a moral approach is the Captain Planet cartoons, which you all might be a little too young to remember. But growing up, we used to watch these cartoons about a superhero named Captain Planet who went out there and protected the environment at all costs. And of course, he did so by taking down villains whose goal it seemed to be was to pollute for the sake of polluting. Uh, some of these villains had kind of interesting names, including things like uh, 
Loot and Plunder, Duke Nukem, Hoggis Greedily. These were all people who uh, polluted to achieve their own ends. And, of course, their desire for whatever it is they wanted at the expense of the environment was uh, considered wrong. These were considered, again, the bad people in the cartoon. Whereas Captain Planet and the Planeteers were considered those uh, noble individuals because they were out there to protect the environment. So again, in this class, we're going to be focusing on the economic approach, right? We're going to take a look at uh, economic issues and environmental issues from a, an economic standpoint using the idea of, again, cost-benefit analysis or competing preferences. We're not going to elevate some preferences as being morally superior to others. Right. With that in mind, the economic approach is going to be using these analytical models, and uh, economists are going to present theories and models that involve simplifying assumptions. Now, a lot of people take issue with economic models that use these simplifying assumptions as being unrealistic. So uh, when we go through some of these models, we might be saying something like, assume that there's only two firms in the industry. And people might, be, people might start saying things like, well, what if there are more firms in the industry? Doesn't that make this model less useful? But I want you to think of these economic models as kind of like a roadmap. They're not designed to give you every single detail. They're designed to, they're designed to kind of point you in a certain direction or kind of help you understand the basics of what you need to know. Right. So, for example, if you're trying to think about how to get from Riverside to Los Angeles and you don't know, you might use a map. And this map is uh, going to make a lot of unrealistic assumptions. For example, the map's not going to be the actual size of the distance from Riverside to Los Angeles. It's going to leave off a lot of stuff that you're going to see along the way, like trees or water towers or billboards or buildings, right? And the highway's not really a thin green line, right? And the city isn't really a black dot. There's a lot of unrealistic things about that map. But the idea of that map is to just kind of give you a general idea of how to get from point A to point B, right? So you look at that map and say, hey, we can probably take 60 west most of the way and end up in Los Angeles. And that's kind of what economic models are, right? They're not supposed to be realistic, but they're supposed to give you a general idea of how to get from point A to B, again, focusing on the most important details, right? So even if you're not using a paper map, but you're using a GPS, that GPS isn't going to look realistic compared to how the real world looks, but it is going to tell you how to get from one point to another. It's going to give you the information that you need in order to kind of uh, help you see what's important. And that's what these economic models are going to do as well. So again, they're not supposed to be realistic. They're supposed to be simplified for uh, the uh, reason of, again, allowing you to see what's most important and hopefully uh, arriving at some conclusions based off of that, uh, the simplifying assumptions. So with that in mind, when we're talking about environmental policy, economists today are more influential than they ever were before in the environmental policy debate, has cost-benefit analysis, and uh, results have become more widely accepted. So if you are studying economics and you're interested in environmental policy, there's no better time now than to be in your shoes as economists have become more influential in today's environmental policy debates. So environmental policy varies greatly in both its efficiency and effectiveness. And again, today, more and more economists are being used to make sure that these policies are as efficient as possible. Um, a lot of programs try to get the maximum improvement to the environmental quality at the expense of the resources spent. Former EPA director William Riley said, at this level of expenditure and importance, there is a very large obligation to get it right. And again, we're relying more and more on economic models to do so. So again, it's a good time to be alive if you're interested in both economics and the environment. With that in mind, let's talk a little bit about some natural uh, resource economics, uh, inc including areas of study and work. So this isn't stuff that I necessarily asked you on the exam, but stuff that you're probably going to want to know for when you're deciding if you want to go into one of these fields. So one of the particular fields you can go into is what is referred to as mineral economics, which looks at things like the appropriate rates of extraction of minerals, how exploration and extraction respond to mineral prices. Um, these are the kinds of things that you might study in this particular field. Uh, fourth economics exams appropriate harvest rates and how government policy affects those harvest rates. We're actually going to get into forest management when we get to Chapter 7 and talk about uh, how forest managers work to make sure that those people who own particular timber stands uh, can get the most out of those timber stands while at the same time not necessarily reducing the future value of those timber stands through their harvesting methods. So we're going to explore that one in a lot of detail when we get to Chapter 7. Uh, marine economics examines rules and regulations needed to manage fisheries and how harvest rates affect the stocks of fish. 
I, I'm actually a certified uh, scuba dive master, and I help teach these scuba classes here at UC Riverside. There's actually a scuba scholarship available. I've actually posted the information for that uh, scuba scholarship on the student opportunities page of your uh, iLearn course site. And uh, as a scuba uh, dive master, one thing that I've done is I've actually worked with the organization for Artif artificial reefs, doing things like fish counts to see, again, how uh, fish populations have uh, been affected by the imposition of artificial reefs and other things that affect the environment. So if you're interested in marine economics, you might need, actually need to learn how to scuba dive. And again, there's a scholarship available uh, uh, here at UC Riverside to help you learn that. So if that's an area that you're interested in, right, there's no uh, better time now than to start working on those kinds of skills. Land economics examines how the private sector makes decisions regarding the use of land and how property rights and public use regulations affect the way space is devoted to different users. So again, if you're interested in kind of uh, uh, how regulations affect how land is used, then land economics might be something that you'd be interested in. Energy economics examines appropriate rates for extracting underground petroleum deposits and the elasticity of energy use in relation to energy prices. So if you want to study how the extraction of things like coal or natural gas or how the use of nuclear energy is affected by uh, changes in energy prices, then this might be something that you'd be more interested in. Water economics examines how water laws affect the way water is utilized and how regulations govern the allocation of water, right? That could uh, be something that could interest uh, you, right? Uh, if you want to look at how laws affect maybe how water is allocated between agricultural and urban users. And then agricultural economics examines how farmers make decisions about using conservation practices when cultivating their land, how government programs affect the choices farmers make regarding what crops to produce and how to produce them, uh, things like how changes in tax law or subsidies influences farmer behavior is something that could be included in this particular area of study. So if this is something that interests you, you might want to check out agricultural economics as a potential field of worker study. So the paper that you're going to be writing for this class, one of the parts of that paper involves researching a, a graduate program in environmental science. And then another part of that paper involves researching a particular field that you might want to work in in uh, uh, environmental science. And the reason why I make that part of the paper is because a lot of people, when you're taking these upper division economic electives, right, you're taking them maybe because they interest you, but you also might be taking them because you might be interested in working in this particular field. And so I want you to kind of learn a little bit more about the field before you make your decision as to whether or not you want to pursue it further. So that's why I kind of made that parts of your paper. And if you're interested in any of these fields, you can include that as kind of the uh, area that you might be interested in working in. So that's kind of a background on some different areas of natural resource economics. And that's going to conclude our uh, uh, lecture, uh, our uh, video, part two uh, video for our chapter one lectures. Uh, when we pick it up next uh, lecture, we're going to be talking about the climate change debate, which I imagine is on a lot of people's minds when they signed up for this class. And so we're going to get into that debate in a lot of detail. The one thing I'm going to ask you as we start that uh, uh, third lecture here for Chapter 1 is that you keep an open mind when it comes to this debate. Again, I'm going to go over why both sides of the political spectrum might be uh, uh, exaggerating their claims when it comes to this debate. So we'll get into that in more detail when we pick it up with uh, part three of our chapter one lectures. Until then, I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. Please let me know if you have any questions, and I will see you next time for the very last part of chapter one. Till then, take care.